And two weeks into his presidency, Trump's foreign policy is still unclear. In some ways, it mirrors that of former President Barack Obama, while in others, it's a monumental departure. The only constant, it seems, is inconsistency. Let's bring in our guest. Joining us here in Doha is Ibrahim Freyhat. He's a professor of conflict resolution at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. He also specializes on foreign policy in Hartford, Connecticut. Leah Wright Regeur, assistant professor of public policy at Harvard University. And in Nashville, Tennessee, Scotty Nell Hughes, political commentator and correspondent with the USA Radio Network. A very warm welcome to all of you. Let me start off with you, Scotty Nell Hughes. What is Donald Trump's foreign policy? The key is about foreign policy with Donald Trump. He is going to first, these first 100 days, fulfill the campaign promises that he made. So many times politicians run for office and then they go into it once they get elected, they don't fulfill those promises. And then later on, the people hold them accountable at the ballot box. Donald Trump, President Trump, from day one has always just gone down this line. So I don't think it's been necessarily unpredictable on anything if you have studied actually the words that he said on the campaign trail. As for his foreign policy, as you stated, it's America first. The status quo has changed. And so I think these first two weeks has been about reestablishing respect. And respect is a two-way street with some of these countries. And while we, he might reach out to people who in the past have had hurt feelings or had hurt relations, like Vladimir Putin in Russia, his new goal, I think, is to reestablish those and, and sort of form a nor network to, do a, to go against what we all have in common, fighting Okay, okay when you talk about respect, I mean, just talk me through his conversation uh, the other day on the phone with the Australian a prime minister, the Muslim ban. I mean, how does that fit into respect? Well, first of all, it is not a Muslim ban. It is a ban. It is a travel ban on certain countries that on is known Muslims for terrorism. Only. Well, no, it's, it's anybody that comes from those countries. And if it was a Muslim ban, then you would have it from 40 more countries. And let's just let me just go on and strike this. On the day that he announced this, 325,000 people traveled from international and landed here in the United States. I guarantee there were Muslims that were included that, and they had zero issues coming in. 109 of them have caused this issue. It is a temporary ban so that we can sit here and figure out what is wrong with our system that has been broken in the past. We have a definitely a less than perfect validation system going through with all of our refugees and people who travel from this country. So it, it, Mr. Trump is putting, he has said time and time again, I'm going to protect American families first. That includes American Muslim families who have also come over here legally, running away from those who want to kill them in their home countries. I can see the anger emanating from your face from here, Leah right, Regeer. It's confusion. <laughs> um, I actually agree with, with Scotty that Donald Trump is doing exactly what he said he would do on the campaign trail. Mm. He said time and time again that these were the things that he was going to do. Um, I think what's different about it, though, is that at times it's erratic. Uh, we've heard different things from him at different points in time, including him using the phrase ban and him sent, walking it back and saying it wasn't a ban. We've heard that from his surrogates and from his supporters and from his press secretary as well. The problem is, is that it has affected relationships and it has affected, you know, thousands of people. Um, I think it's the New York Times that just reported that 60,000 people with visas have been affected by this travel, whatever you want to call it, restriction, ban, executive order. That's a problem. If we branch that out a little bit more, I mean, where will it leave relations with Muslim countries, with Islam? I mean, is it putting America on a more secure footing by behaving in this manner? Well, I think it's come out right now, including from conservative sources, from liberal sources. You know, Cato Institute just, insi uh, just issued a statement saying this will not uh, protect America's borders or make America safer. Um, a federal judge in Washington state has just ruled that the ban is unconstitutional. Um, and we've seen that our president has reacted very early this morning to that ban. Um, so I think in the next couple of weeks, what we're going to see is consistent pressure on uh, the president. We're going to see consistent pressure on, uh, uh, pressure on homeland security. And we're going to see American allies, traditional American allies, calling the United States out. I think that's the part that's for deep concern, that American allies are saying that they want to reevaluate their relationships with, relationship with the United States, who they're arguing are, are acting from an erratic place um, uh, right now. Ibrahim Frehat, how worried should America's 
allies be and, and how does this sit into his foreign policy as you see it? Uh, what well, we have seen that uh, President Trump uh, has made uh, a paradigm shift like from what uh, U.S. presidents usually do when they run for elections and reach to, you know, to, to office. Uh, other U.S. presidents used to make some strong statements, sometimes extremist statements, and when they get to the office, they are in power, they behave in a more realistic, moderate way compared to the statements that they made during election campaigns. I think in the first two weeks of what we have seen that uh, Trump has made even more statements and took more actions compared to what he said during his election campaigns. I can't believe that in two weeks we are talking about putting countries on notice, as uh, Michael Flynn, his national security advisor, did with Iran, and banning uh, seven uh, Muslim majority countries from uh, coming to the United States, alienating uh, his traditional allies, had a tough call with uh, Australian uh, Prime Minister the other day, just yesterday actually, mm -hmm and with tension with Europe, his traditional allies. And the only improvement actually that he made is with, his, uh, with, with Israel and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who shares similar extremist uh, right-wing ideology, political ideology, and racist ideology. And that, that's the only improvement that, that he made. Otherwise, I, I think that he has uh, made this uh, uh, even went far beyond what we expected to see uh, during his campaign in the first two weeks. Scotty? Well, that's not true because actually, as it has come out, President uh, the Jordan King Abdullah had a great visit with President Trump he and his key staff and actually said that he actually wanted to step up the campaign against the extremists and actually agreed in strengthening the border. So, no, there has been several good calls, several good conversations and visit with including largely Muslim territories and Muslim, largely Muslim uh, countries, because in the end, I think we all want to keep our citizens, the good people, safe. And right now we're all dealing with this threat from ISIS and other terrorist groups that want to kill good people that live across the world. So that so there there is actually been some a lot of other good countries that have actually stepped up in the relationships uh, just are just because he's going against Iran. Iran was never a friend of ours. Iran the Iran deal did not make our friendship. If anything, it was just a spit in the face that Iran did to America. Okay, you bring in Iran. Let's break it down. His foreign policy <clears throat> issue by issue, starting with Iran. Now, throughout his campaign, President Trump repeatedly slammed the Iran nuclear deal. But since taking office, he hasn't made any move towards cancelling the deal. That said, he was quick to reprimand Iran for firing a ballistic missile this week. Trump tweeted that Iran's been put on notice and the White House imposed new economic sanctions on Iran on Friday. Ibrahim, what does on notice actually mean? Well, that's actually the bigger question, the $1 million question. What is, how far is he going to go? Honestly, I think he went far beyond what we expected. I, we all expected that there would be some tension with Iran, but to put Iran on notice in the first two weeks, that was way beyond what we expected. And this actually has taken me back to, the, to 2000, to the Bush administration time when he came to office and started all this policy of preparing for the war in Iraq. I think if when I started to compare 2000 to what we have today, he again, I reiterate, he went way beyond what, what, uh, what Bush did in 2000. And we start, he started talking about uh, you know, this kind of escalation. And I think the ambiguity of what on notice means is part of the message, because this means that all options are on the table. And he said it, that all options are on the table, which means including military. And that might be including you know, some, some form of a military action, which the region cannot take at this point. I mean, we have been going through this since 2003. Leah, could he repudi repudiate the agreement that's been put into place? Where does it leave U.S.'s relationship with the other five powers? And how wise is it to antagonize Iran? The big point here is that we really just don't know. Um, I would hope that, you know, this isn't, you know, putting everyone on notice literally. Um, I think that one of the things that we've seen come out from uh, the White House is don't necessarily take the president's words seriously. Um, and I'm hoping that's the case here. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that he does have cabinet members and he does have cabinet members who may be a moderating force on him. Let's hope that's the case here. But again, I think it, it's, you know, 
it, it's really hard to predict with someone like Donald Trump what the next move is going to be. Does it, are you suggesting though that real politics, that pragmatism will eventually win the day when it comes to US politics because of the checks and balances? I would hope so. I would, I would hope so, but I don't think there's any clear indication that that may be the case. Because if we do take his words literally, then that points in a very different direction. If we don't take his words literally and we don't necessarily say, oh, well, you know, maybe that's not what he's trying to get, the point that he's trying to get across. Maybe he's just trying to, you know, intimidate or use kind of big, bold language, then there's a very, there could be a very different outcome. The problem is that thus far we've seen that Donald Trump has said exactly what he means and what he intends and indicated, you know, what he intends to do. Well, there's been a, a lot of talk of Trump colluding with Russia. Some say Moscow-backed hackers may have helped him win the election. Then there were concerns that Trump would return the favor through U.S. foreign policy. But so far, that doesn't seem to be the case. Here's what U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley said earlier this week. We do want to better our relations with Russia. However, the dire situation in eastern Ukraine is one that demands clear and strong condemnation of Russian actions. The sudden increase in fighting in eastern Ukraine has trapped thousands of civilians and destroyed vital infrastructure. And the crisis is spreading, endangering many thousands more. This escalation of violence must stop. Scotty, you said he abides by what he says, but when it comes to Russia, I mean, it seems to be a rather dramatic turnaround for the administration. What's going on there? Well, I think, uh, first of all, he's putting people in place and letting them help make the decisions uh, on what the policy is going to be, taking their advisement. But I think this is just diplomacy at its best in this case. Just because you have an ally doesn't mean that you have to endorse 100 percent of what they're doing. And I think that is what uh, Nikki Haley was pointing out. Listen, we do want to have strong relations with them, strong friendship with them, like with any other country that is helping us fight ter terrorism. But we also do not want to encourage what they are doing in Ukraine and want to do everything we can to actually help lessen that situation and, and put diplomacy back into action there. So I think that it's more important. I think and it's going to be I think that's the way they're going to handle. If you think that just because you have a handshake and a friendship with President Trump means that he is going to agree 100 percent and go along with whatever you do in your country. President Trump is making sure that he says, no, I am going to take it on a case by case basis. The good old boy network of just giving you a blanket check mark does not work. Uh, with this administration. Yeah, is this a smart move? Is it good political diplomacy? Is he putting his foot down and saying he's not Putin's puppet? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that this is the influence of his cabinet who's suggesting that, you know, these are things, these are actions that are unacceptable. Um, on the other hand, right, we've seen that they've lifted some of the economic sanctions on Russia from stemming from the, um, you know, the, the punishments from their involvement in the campaign. Um, this may also be pressure from, um, I think, congressional Republicans who have indicated that they do not trust Russia. They are very concerned about the situation in the Ukraine, uh, in the Ukraine and it does, um, it does warrant um, the president saying something um, about uh, Russian involvement in other parts of the world. Could Russia be his undoing? I mean, we still don't know the extent of Russia's involvement. Well, let me first uh, slightly disagree with uh, <coughs> your uh, guest from uh, Hartford, uh, which is on the moderating force uh, within his cabinet. I'm not sure that this really exists because we have uh, around Mr. Trump, we have Michael Flynn, uh, who in August actually talked about the entire Muslim world, 1.7 billion Muslims that are uh, uh, that are Muslims and Islam is a, a vicious cancer in his mm -hmm. words and should be eradicated. And he made these it's, statements it's, it's before, obsession, isn't it? exactly, yeah. before he was appointed as national security advisor. And Mr. Trump knows his political ideology. We all know the ideology of also political ideology of uh, Steve Bannon. So I, the, with these people around him, it's, it's very scary. And where the, how, how far he's going to go with these things. And these, you know, these people, their uh, ideology is very well known again before uh, they were appointed. So here, I think the, the really alarming component of understanding Mr. Trump's foreign policy is driven by, certain, by an ideology. 
which is unlike actually the other administrations, the Obama administration, or even other like Bill Clinton and, and others. Uh, there is an ideology here that's driving this force or this foreign policy, which is very scary. Okay, which is, uh, by the way, if, if you mm -hmm. may allow just me very uh, quickly so on, on Russia, which is uh, unlike what we have seen with his traditional allies, mm -hmm. the nature of this relationship has not been uh, explained enough and there are no available data for us as analysts to understand what is exactly the nature of this relationship where he goes so bad with his allies like Europe and Australia and at the same time accommodating uh, Russia at the same time. That ideology we're talking about, I mean, I wonder so, where it sits uh, uh, as far as Israel is concerned. It's another country uh, that was counting on Trump's complete support. Leah, I'll be with you in a second. When the Obama administration allowed the UN to condemn Israel's settlement expansion in December, Trump tweeted, they used to have a great friend in the US, but not anymore. The beginning of the end was the horrible Iran deal. And now this UN exclamation mark, stay strong Israel, January the 20th is fast approaching. The Israeli government was emboldened by those remarks and has announced plans to build around 6,000 settlements since Trump took office. But this week the White House released a statement saying, while we don't believe the existence of settlements is an impediment to peace, the construction of new settlements or the expansion of existing settlements beyond their current borders may not be helpful in achieving that goal. Another Another change, another flip-flopping here, Scotty. Well, I don't necessarily agree with this statement. And once again, this is a statement that's put a, been put out. Let me just give you a little insight into what's going on within the administration right now, because we keep talking about his advisors. The thing is, is that you've got a lot of people around the President Trump that are putting out statements that are causing a lot of the drama, a lot of the chaos, a lot of the confusion that we're discussing today. Uh, what I have learned being around the campaign and watching President Trump and also candidate Trump is that unless it actually comes out of his mouth, has his signature on it, Sometimes you have to go if there are other people that are underestimating that he can handle the situation and, and doing things on purpose. So, so are possibly. you saying that when it comes to his advisors, they are some of them are undermining him and they're not well, on the I same don't know about page? I mean, if that's the case, where does this leave undermining, but him? <laughs> I'm going to put more faith and trust in a tweet that comes directly from his fingertips in this case than necessarily a statement put out by the White House because, unfortunately, now, like I said, it says it may. This just might be so, some conversations that are going on right now. But I know that President Trump has always been firmly behind uh, Israel and the work that they're doing in the state of Israel. And so I don't, th this would, I'll be the first to say that I was a little bit confused when this statement came out because it did not seem like something that would go along with President Trump and what he has been saying up until today. Okay, so I'm confused. So is he supporting settlements here? We know he's meeting Netanyahu very soon. What's the conversation there? I think well, I don't. Well, I, th I think we have to wait until the official comment. Like I said, the, that word in there was may, possibly. These are not hardcore, concrete, con you know, concrete uh, answers that say yes or no either way. Okay. It does look like a little bit of a wavering. But I think we wait until after that conversation comes out and, and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu comes out and actually says uh, with President Trump exactly what the policy is going to be. Well, I can tell you one thing, that when you see Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli Prime Minister, in one room, then I can tell you, I can assure you that the world has never become more dangerous than what you see uh, at the moment. When you see those two individuals allying and working together, and what we have seen so far, actually, that all the actions or the policies that Trump has taken are in that uh, in that direction. He appointed his uh, uh, the U.S. ambassador to Israel, someone who supports settlements um, in the West Bank, and also his son-in-law, who's in the same line with supporting settlements as well. Uh, so. Uh, to see that and that will be the first president actually that or prime minister that he's going to meet and I go back to Scott's words about uh, meeting President uh, King Abdullah he did not uh, meet King Abdullah uh, as also this was requested for him to meet preserving this honor for Benjamin Netanyahu who shares with him the same political ideology extremism racism and uh, and and driving the world into uh, a more dangerous than ever before and that that's very scary and that's actually I'm not waiting to see what's going to happen when they meet because his actions already talk a lot about the direction that he's taking uh, whether it's regarding settlements or regarding the two-state solutions or regarding the rights of the Palestinians you know for their statehood mm -hmm. 
uh, he refused so far uh, and uh, to give assurances about uh, the moving of the Israel, the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This has yeah. been requested I mean, many stoke. times, and he refused to give any assurances that he will not take. And that was requested by King Abdullah in his last visit, and he did not respond to that. Got it. Okay, we're going to move to another part of the world. Newly appointed Defense Secretary James Mattis is in South Korea and Japan this week. It is the first international trip by any of Trump's cabinet members. Japan and South Korea had been strengthening military ties with the Obama administration to counter a perceived threat from North Korea. During the campaign, Trump had threatened to withdraw U.S. support unless South Korea and Japan paid more of the cost. Leah, are we seeing a shift now to Asia? We saw it under Barack Obama, but it was put on hold. And is this a good thing? So I think when I, to, to your do, guess and uh, Doha's point, when I was talking about the moderating influence in the cabinet, I was talking about Mattis. And so I think this is somebody I who um, is particularly in his testimony in front of, in front of Senate, in the Senate, um, has shown that he has very different, uh, very different positions from the president and from the rest of the Trump and from Steve Bannon. And I think that's important, yes, particularly at a moment like right now. And so we're going to see, we're going to see how much of an influence that a cabinet member like Mattis can have. So this is why it's important that he is taking international trips and that he is being representative. The other thing, though, is that the White House has to own the things that come out of the White House. That is part of, I mean, this is part of being president. This is part of being a presidential administration, which is that if your White House puts it out, then it's a statement from the White House. So I think right now what we're seeing is, is an incredible amount of kind of back and forth between people in the White House, people, things that don't necessarily match up. And that's one of the things that President Trump is going to have to get in, in check, particularly as it comes to foreign policy in the next couple of weeks. Scotty, do you think he could have done this better? I mean, there, it was a perfect opportunity and possibly he squandered this to put American for, foreign policy on a more secure footing. Absolutely. But I think a lot of this falls on the hands of Democrats right now who are refusing and acting like children and refusing to confirm his actual administration, his cabinet members. We're here two weeks in. President Tr Trump showed up on day one ready to work and the Kleenex holding Chuck Schumer and all of the Democrats alongside him have not shown up. And therefore, President Trump has been doing a lot of this, having to kind of go back and forth between prior administrations, has seats that are not filled, not being able to fully disclose security uh, security issues with some of these cabinet members just because the Democrats are refusing to confirm several of his folks until just this past week. I think going forward, you'll have a lot more streamlined, a lot more efficient in communication and between all of the different cabinet positions and the different the different roles that they play. And uh, when you look at what is going on, at least the Japanese politicians are a lot smarter than the Democrats because they have come up with a plan in, in, in preparedness for President Trump's visit where they're already presenting hundreds of thousands of jobs that they want to invest in the United States. They're already coming up with a job package for the United States. They're okay. already going ahead of the game. That's exactly how you have good foreign relations. And I think it just shows the respect that President Trump has already earned from okay. the, uh, the leadership of Japan. Are we seeing a shift to Asia now? Well, we saw that under Barack Obama, so there's some sort of overlapping of policy. And do you think, I mean, it's still early days that Donald Trump should be given a chance? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel as far as you're concerned? Well, I, uh, I was one of the very first people that I wanted to give him uh, a chance to see uh, how different his statements will be from the statements that he made during the election campaigns. I admit he uh, surprised me, but the other way around, that he made even more radical, more extreme statements after he uh, became in office, which is, I don't see that this, uh, this, this administration really cares about Asia or the Middle East or anyone. Uh, I think their, their actions, they're going to be mostly thinking that they're serving their own constituency. I don't think this serves anyone. I think this will make the world uh, way more than, dangerous than ever before. I don't think this brings security to the United States. This is what George Bush uh, said in 2000 mm -hmm. and in 2003 when he invaded uh, Iraq in 2003. Okay. And Abraham, I think that Iraq. he created all the insecurity uh, for everyone, including We're the We're going to have to leave it there. Ibrahim, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you to Scotty Nell Hughes and Leah Wright-Rigueur.
Big topic there. Thank you very much for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, please go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Give us your feedback. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. Mine is at Jane Dutton. Goodbye and thanks for watching.